It is five o'clock on the dot, but we will give just a few more minutes um, for some more people to join us before we get started. Give just another minute or two, some more people are joining. All right, I will go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here for this webinar on medical school scholarships and the road to equitable health care. My name is Nikki Disbro, and I'm the Associate Director of Development for the School of Medicine and School of Medicine Basic Sciences. I'm thrilled to be introducing Dr. Kim Vinson, who's the host of this webinar. Dr. Vinson is an Associate Professor of Otolaryngology in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She graduated from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine in 2003 and completed her internship in general surgery and her residency in otolaryngology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in Little Rock. She also completed a fellowship in laryngology and care of the professional voice at the Vanderbilt Voice Center. Dr. Vincent's clinical practice specializes in voice, swallowing, and breathing disorders. In 2011, she was named Assistant Dean for Vanderbilt University School of Medicine's newly reorganized Office for Diversity Affairs. Her focus is on improving diversity and inclusion within the medical school and clinical learning environments. She is also the Program Director of the Undergraduate Clinical Research Internship Program for exceptional undergraduate students interested in pursuing a career in medicine, as well as the Director for the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine Pipeline Programs with regional colleges and universities. In 2020, she was promoted to Associate Dean for Diversity Affairs. In addition to Dr. Vinson, we will also have two special guests on this webinar, Dominique Mosley and Dr. Donald Brady, who will all introduce themselves later in the presentation. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom. Dr. Vinson, thank you for hosting this webinar and thank you for your passion and knowledge on these topics. I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you so much, Nikki, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank each of you for joining us this evening um, to talk a little bit about Vanderbilt University School of Medicine and um, how we're working towards equitable health care for our patients. Um, and so um, I am going to share just a brief presentation um, with you. And then, as Nikki said, we'll have some guests join us here a little later, um, but I would really just like to start off by sharing a little bit um, of my story um, and what led me to being here with you guys this evening. Um, so I have wanted to be a doctor um, for as long as I can remember. Um, and really from the time I was about seven or eight was really focused 
on figuring out what I needed to do to be a physician. I think it really stemmed from wanting to have a career where I could help others. Um, and being a physician seemed like the most noble way to be able to do that. Um, I grew up in a middle-class family, middle-class working family, um, but my parents really supported me and my little brother. Um, and my dad always promised us that he would pay for four years of higher education. Um, we only got four years, and so we could do with that what we needed to. Um, but that was something that I always hung on to um, as I went through middle school, high school, um, and then started to think about college. Um, I was really blessed. Um, I was able to receive a number of scholarships to college. Um, I worked as an RA during college. I had work study job. Um, and so I really let my dad off the hook for college. Um, he didn't have to pay for me to go to college, but he knew that I wanted to go to medical school um, and knew that he would be there to support me um, in that endeavor. Um, and so during college, when it came time to apply to medical school, I um, started to kind of doubt myself and doubt my ability to be accepted into a medical school. Um, there were two wonderful state schools in my state, and so I figured that my best chances were probably going to be at one of those schools. Um, but I decided to apply to Vanderbilt, um, and that was a bit of a reach for me. I, I did it just because I wanted to be able to tell my children at some point that, hey, these are the schools that I applied to, um, but, but never thought that I would be given an opportunity um, to visit Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. And so after applying, um, I actually interviewed at one of my state schools and was actually accepted to that school um, before I received a letter in the mail inviting me um, to come to an interview here at Vanderbilt. Um, and I got really excited about that, um, but still didn't think that being a Vanderbilt medical school student was something that would be possible for me. But I, I drove up to Nashville from Birmingham, Alabama, um, and I had the most wonderful day um, on my interview day here. I, I got to sit down and spend time with a faculty member. Actually, after that interview, I thought I had bombed it because I didn't feel that I'd been interviewed. Um, I just felt like I'd had a wonderful conversation with someone. Um, all the administrators and faculty members I met that day were happy and excited to tell me about this school. Um, the students that I met um, were very honest and they told me that they worked really hard, but they all told me this with smiles on their faces. And it was obvious that they were very happy um, to be students here. Um, and so I left that day being super excited about Vanderbilt, but again, thinking, I'm not gonna get in. And even if I get in, there's no way that I can afford to go to Vanderbilt. And so I got an acceptance letter um, and was proud of that fact. But again, um, was going to file that away because there's no way that I could ask my dad to pay for a private medical school education. Um, and then a couple of weeks after that, I received another, another letter that literally changed my life. Um, and it was a letter offering me a full tuition scholarship to this school. Um, and I distinctly remember opening that letter in my dorm room um, and almost being in tears um, that this, this, this opportunity that didn't seem like a reality to me could actually be a reality. Um, and, and so that is part of what got me um, here today. And so I just wanted to share um, a little bit about that with you guys um, before we get started. Um, so this is a picture of me and my dad um, in front of Light Hall. Um, on graduation day. So wanted just to share a little bit about um, some of our current students. And so you'll see this infographic um, on the left of your screen that really tells us a lot about our current first year medical school class. Um, they are a wonderful group of future physicians. Um, and a couple of things that I wanna highlight on this slide is, is um, they are 55% women. Um, they are very smart and intelligent, as you can see by their GPAs and their MCAT scores. Um, they have broad interests outside of medicine, and they have done really spectacular things. Um, one of the things, one of the stats on this sheet that I'm probably most proud of is that 30% of them identify as an underrepresented in medicine minority student. The other thing that was really exciting about this class is, is if you guys recall last July, um, many medical schools were really scrambling, trying to figure out how to invite a new group of students um, into their schools. 
Um, and we were able to bring our students to campus and start the medical school year in person. Um, countless staff and administrators worked really hard to make sure that we had protocols and safe to keep our students um, safe during the pandemic, um, but they were able to join us in person um, and are progressing well during their, their first year. Um, as we looked to the next class of students, there were a lot of questions about what would applications to medical schools look like in the midst of a pandemic. Um, Vanderbilt is already a very competitive school to get into. Um, as you can see, last cycle we received um, 5,800 applications for 96 spots in our class. Um, and we were really surprised that the number of applications re received significantly increased this year. Um, so we received more than 6,800 applications for this current cycle. Um, we released more secondaries than we've ever released. Um, and in conducting virtual interviews, we were able to interview about 100 more students than we typically are able to do um, here on campus and in person. Um, and in thinking through the virtual interviews, this was something that was really exciting because I think it really allows not only us, but all schools to be a little bit more inclusive um, and who we interview. Um, so students who may not have had um, finances to be able to travel all around the country to interview for medical school can now do that much cheaply, much more cheaply now that we have, um, have virtual interviews. And so that was exciting. Um, to see if the diversity within our applicants would grow um, because of that fact. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what is Vanderbilt University Medical School been doing with regards to equity? Um, this is definitely something that has come to the forefront over the last several years and especially so um, over the last um, 14 to, to 16 months. Um, and we really have been doing a lot of work um, during this time. Um, and it, it all kind of starts with our leadership. And so of course that leadership comes from the top um, with Dean Balzer, um, but he has really um, put in place some wonderful leaders. Um, Dr. Andre Churchwell, who is our senior associate dean um, for um, the Office for Diversity Affairs is also our chief diversity officer at the medical, at the medical center. Um, I get to serve as the associate dean in that office. Um, it, it has been around for a long time, which I think is something that's very unique when it comes to um, medical school's commitments to diversity and inclusion. Um, the office in its current form started um, when I was a fourth year student here. Um, and um, then, um, like Nikki said earlier, was reorganized in, in 2011, and that's when I came on board. Um, in 2019, Dean Balzer established an office for health equity um, and named Consuelo Wilkins, our associate dean for health equity. And she's also the vice president for health equity at VUMC. Um, and so there's lots of good work going on in both of these offices um, to really make sure that Vanderbilt is, is doing all of the things to be a diverse institution, to be an inclusive place where people feel comfortable and welcome and to really start to address inequities in how we deliver healthcare. We have some very strong student organizations whose missions are to really um, work to mitigate health disparities in certain populations. Um, the organizations that you see on the screen um, are led by extremely dedicated students. Um, and a lot of these organizations, our Vanderbilt chapters are known nationally for doing work um, to mitigate disparities in the African-American population with the Student National Medical Association, um, the Latino population and the Latino Medical Students Association, um, a PAMSA Asian American um, population um, for those who identify as LGBT. Um, we have a group that is really focused on what, what can we do to make care for these patients better. Um, a newer organization um, is our 1GMD, and so this is an organization really focused on first-generation students um, and trying to find ways to support those students and the unique challenges that they face. Um, and then we also have a social mission committee um, that is really dedicated to forming lasting relationships with partners in the community, um, again, um, to improve health equity and access to care for patients. 
we have significant medical education efforts as well. Um, and so um, iterative review of our patient cases used in our case-based learning, excuse me, case-based learning sessions for our first year students, um, constantly revising those with the help of students to ensure equity in the patients that are being presented. Um, all of our medical students have received at least one um, session on microaggressions and ways um, to be able to address those here on our campus. Um, they've also received unconscious bias training. And then um, we have a new reporting system in the last year and a half, specific, specifically for our medical students, um, RISE to be able to report um, things that they see in our learning environment that are, um, that are not in line with our views on diversity and inclusion. Um, but then also to be able to recognize people in our learning communities that really hold these values highly and demonstrate that to our system, our, to our system. So all of these things are really working um, to make our students and our faculty um, more aware of how we interact in a learning environment and the ways that we can, we can work together to make it an inclusive place. Um, Another initiative that I wanted to highlight for you guys today is um, our medical school pipeline program. Um, so in 2017, um, this work was really spearheaded uh, by Dean Bonnie Miller and Dr. Churchwell, um, realizing that we wanted to show commitment um, to undergraduate students in our region um, and specifically focus on recruiting African-American students and students from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, so Vanderbilt Medical School now has formal partnerships with four universities. Um, Berea College is in Berea, Kentucky, um, and it's a really um, cool school. And so if you don't know about Berea, um, it is a place of higher education for students from traditionally lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and students who attend Berea um, are able to get an education um, without graduating with debt. Um, Fisk University is a historically black college here in Nashville. Um, Morehouse College and Spelman College are HBCUs in the Atlanta area. Um, Morehouse is an all men's college while Spelman, Spelman is an all women's college. Um, and so each year, each of these schools nominates um, a new student to join our pipeline program. And these students are able to come to Vanderbilt during their summers for research experience science enrichment, um, MCAT prep, um, and the thought that if they successfully complete their summers here, um, maintain a good GPA um, and score well on the MCAT, um, that they are automatically given an interview here at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. And the thought is if they've done all of that, that they should really be a shoe in for admission to our school. Um, and so here you'll see a photo of Dominique Mosley um, from Spelman College. She is our first matriculant from this program. She's one of our current first year students. Um, and you guys will hear from her here in just a little bit. Another thing that I wanted to highlight is that um, our students are really incredible and they're really um, socially minded and want to make medicine um, better. Um, and so last July, um, a group of students um, residents, fellows, and faculty members um, successfully lobbied for our medical center to stop using race-based adjustments for EGFR. Um, and so um, those students were Annie Apple, um, P.D. Carr, and Tita Gonzalez-Pena, um, but really working for about a year um, lobbying for us to stop using this measurement. Um, and they were successful in that endeavor. Um, Recently, five additional students um, have worked to create a toolkit that has been published um, to show other students how they can work for social change like this on their medical center campuses as well. Um, and so those students are second year, current second year students, um, Helen Gambra, Whitney George, Sarah Reed, um, Eki Olamese, and Leanne Lamb. Um, are those students. And so we um, are really proud that these students um, saw something that they felt was unjust and really did um, the work to help change that. 
So 2020 was a challenging year for lots of reasons, um, but a time of racial injustice and disparities laid bare by COVID. Um, and so we all saw Brown Americans dying at the hands of police. Um, the pandemic again kind of laid bare disparities that already existed for certain groups um, in regards to healthcare in our country. Um, and it disproportionately has affected people of color. And this was a catalyst for the medical school and the medical center to really take a critical look at what we're doing in regards to this. Um, students came to several of us administrators in the summer really wanting um, to be a part of that change and asking for anti-racism curriculum, um, which we were able um, to find a way to get into the first year students curriculum. Um, as time persisted, Dean Balzer actually commissioned a racial equity task force to really do a deep dive in all of the, the policies and um, the goings on of the medical school and the medical center um, to figure out where we may be um, unintentionally disadvantaging groups of people. Um, and so there were several committees on this task force, but what I think was really unique about it is it was led by a student. Um, so you heard PD, um, PD's name earlier. PD was the um, student selected um, to be a lead for this task force. Um, staff member, um, so Mamie Williams was the staff member elected um, to co-chair this, and then Dr. Michael Debon as the faculty member. Um, but you can see all the members of this task force here who worked really hard um, to evaluate what we're doing here at Vanderbilt, to look at best standards and practices across the country and really think above and beyond to figure out what we can do to make sure that the care that we deliver here um, is equitable. Um, and so this task force prepared um, a proposal to Dean Balzer at the end of the year. And so he is currently going through that proposal um, and with other members of our administration um, coming up with a game plan um, so that we can really do the good work that this committee has charged us with. I don't know how many of you might remember um, the Street Dixie Place. Um, but um, we recently were able, um, again, through the hard work of students, to rename Dixie Place to Vivian Thomas Way. Um, and so over the years, there have been many students, patients, faculty members um, who um, have shuddered whenever they've had to drive by or turn on to Dixie Place. Um, and Dr. Walter Clare, who is one of our college mentors in the medical school, um, charged some of our students um, with the renaming of that street as um, the events of last year unfolded and the students were hungry and looking for ways to make a change and make a difference. Um, and so they took this on full force um, and worked to really work with the medical, the medical center in the city um, to rename um, Dixie Place um, and finally settled on being able to honor um, Vivian Thomas um, by renaming that street after him. And many of you know, um, Vivian Thomas um, worked here at Vanderbilt um, with Dr. Blaylock um, and really was the, the technical um, mastermind um, behind developing surgeries um, for congenital heart disease. Um, and moved on to Hopkins when doc, with Dr. Blaylock once he left um, Vanderbilt. Um, and so this was a really exciting change to be able to honor him um, with a street name off of 21st Avenue. Um, 2020 was also a time for us to celebrate some things. Um, and so as you guys might know, um, with each graduation, each school um, in the university, um, chooses a founders medalist who is, is basically the, the best student. Um, and last year, um, Dr. Kiana Jackson um, was given that award. And so she was actually our medical school's first black founders medalist. Um, and we are so proud of her. Um, she's currently a plastics and reconstructive um, surgery intern here at Vanderbilt. Um, and she also was a Vanderbilt School of Medicine um, scholarship recipient. 
More, new, more good news um, has been on the horizon. And so US News and World Report just recently released their rankings of graduate schools. And when it comes to research medical schools, um, our medical school is now ranked 13, um, which is really exciting. And if we kind of look here um, at the group of our peer institutions um, in the top 20, we are in very good company um, with these medical schools. And so um, these are the schools with which we are competing during admissions um, cycles um, to really recruit those coveted students that will come and make medicine um, a better profession in the future. And so that'll shift a little bit, and we're going to talk just a little bit about the importance of scholarships and, and, and what it means um, to potential students. Scholarships are important for everyone, but especially for underrepresented in medicine students, first generation students, or students that may come from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, Scholarships allow students to start their professional careers without the anxiety or concern about repaying student loans in the future. Um, I really think it allows students to make career specialty choices um, without the pressure to um, pursue a specialty that is traditionally higher paying or potentially choose a private practice position over an academic one because of pay as they think about having to repay um, their student loans. Um, some of you may have received scholarships to Vanderbilt, some of you may not, but if you didn't, how would your life potentially be different if you'd received a scholarship for medical school? Um, I think that's an important question for, for us all to think about. Um, and for those of us who maybe did receive a scholarship, what would life have been like had we not received that scholarship? And so if we, we revisit that list of schools that are our peer institutions, um, the ones that are bolded are schools who've taken great strides and can now offer um, their students scholarships and aid um, that eliminate their need. Um, and so this landscape for um, recruiting students um, to medical school is rapidly changing. Um, and so this is one of the things that we, um, that we consider during every admission cycle um, is, is what can we offer our students and especially, and I know Dean Brady might talk about this a little later, but those who, who have significant need um, because we know that these students will make a difference um, for patients in the future. And so I will end there. Um, and now would love um, to introduce you guys again to Ms. Dominique Mosley, um, one of our current first year students um, who will tell us a little bit about her journey um, to Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Hello everyone. My name is Dominique Mosley. I'm a first year medical student at Vanderbilt and a 2020 graduate of Spelman College, originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I'm also an inaugural participant in the Vanderbilt School of Medicine Pipeline Program. In so many ways, the Pipeline Program and the Dr. JT and Mary P. Davis Scholarship to Vanderbilt have changed my life and empowered me to thrive at Vanderbilt. Before coming to Spelman and learning about the short pipeline program from my pre-health advisor, Dr. Rosalind Bass, I knew nothing about Nashville or Vanderbilt. In fact, Vanderbilt School of Medicine was nowhere near on my radar at that time. Um, but starting from my freshman year of undergrad, uh, my first summer in the pipeline program, the, I was truly just overwhelmed with how invested um, the leaders of the pipeline program were in me as an individual um, from providing academic and professional enrichment to research and clinical mentors. And I'm really thankful to the program for helping lay the foundation for my success as a pre-med and now as a medical student. Um, I really like, I cannot emphasize enough how intentional the leaders of the pipeline program are about making sure that we're, we not only successfully matriculate, but that we feel comfortable and like we belong at Vanderbilt School of Medicine. And I think that makes all the difference. Um, but for me and my family, receiving scholarship money was a deciding factor when choosing both my undergraduate and medical schools. Um, and from my conversations with peers around the country and also prospective students to Vanderbilt, um, money is a deciding factor for a lot of people. Um, I'm grateful to the pipeline program and my scholarship for making it possible for me to attend BUSM, which I feel like is 
really the best fit for me. I love it here. Um, and I'm thankful to all the people who made this opportunity possible. And I hope to continue to work to make this exceptional experience possible for even more underrepresented minority students in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominique. Um, next, we'll hear from Dean Donald Brady, who will share with us. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Dominique. Um, and thanks to everybody who's on here. I'm just so glad to have uh, several people attending. And I'd also invite you uh, as I'm talking or after I'm talking, if you wanna throw questions in the Q&A spot or into the chat room, we'll be glad to address them as we get to them. Um, Kim is bringing up a couple of topics uh, that I'm really passionate about. And I wanna sort of tell you why I'm so passionate about him and why I think it's so important for Vanderbilt School of Medicine. Um, I grew up in Memphis. Um, unlike him, my parents weren't able to tell me I'd get four years of college or four years of higher education, whether that was college or med school. Um, my mom was a bank teller. Uh, my dad, when he was able to work, sold insurance. But for most of my time in high school and beyond, um, was basically unemployed. In fact, I can still remember the day I got my letter for internship and I earned more money as an intern uh, than my parents had ever earned combined uh, in their lives. So for me growing up, my vision of what I could do and who I could be was based in, um, based in what I knew. And the, op the doors that were open from, for me as early as high school, but then by Vanderbilt for undergrad and especially Vanderbilt for medical school, the ability to get a scholarship and to um, belong in this place and have people want me here uh, was life-changing, was totally transformative to uh, my direction as an individual, who I thought I could be, what I wanted to be, and the ability to not have to worry about that. Because I, I can tell you, even having gone to Vanderbilt for undergrad, the idea of going to medical school and being able to pay for medical school was really foreign to me. So I'm, I'm, I'm literally not sure that had I not gotten a scholarship that I would have gone to med school even if I got in. Um, I know a lot of people often talk about, you know, do you, do you really need to, do we really need to provide scholarship money to medical students? Uh, do we need to try to wipe away tuition? Uh, they're going to earn a lot as physicians once they're through. And, and I will tell you my personal, one of my personal perspectives on this is if you're coming from a first generation medicine background, which I was, if you're coming from a lower socioeconomic, low to mid, socioeconomic group, it's hard to see beyond. Uh, so the idea of even borrowing money, which yes, eventually you could maybe earn to pay back, but the concept of what that would mean for you uh, really weighs on a teenager or a person in their early 20s trying to imagine medical school. And, and so now in my role, and, and I, I, I'm a quadruple door. I was an undergrad, a med student, a resident, and now I'm faculty in administration here. Um, Vanderbilt is an incredibly special place. And I'm happy to spend hours with any of you who would like to talk about my passion and vision for Vanderbilt School of Medicine. Um, but it's a really special place with a lot to offer and want, it wants to provide health equity and wants to transform this nation in terms of how it addresses health equity and social justice. It wants to be transformative in its discovery of new knowledge and dealing with the COVID pandemic or curing cancer or every, any other illness that's out there, uh, doing great basic science research, delivering the best care to every patient that walks through the door. What we can be is we can be a place where every individual who could benefit from what Vanderbilt can give in its way to individualize curriculum, 
to be transformative and to help learners see a brighter, different, better future, scholarships allow us to take away the weight of worrying about earnings and worrying about paying for medical school or paying it back in an uncertain economic times to allow them to dream. And so one of my visions uh, for this school is to become one of those places where need-based aid is eliminated. And no, well, sorry, no, let me rephrase that. Need is eliminated. We want to fulfill people's need uh, through need-based aid. That way we get the best, the brightest, the people who can most take advantage of Vanderbilt here to be part of this special place uh, and to become the leaders and champions and clinicians and teachers of the future. Uh, very, very passionate issue for me, very personal, very personal issue for me because without, without the kindness of others, I would not be where I am today. I literally wouldn't. Without the kindness, not just of Vanderbilt, but the individuals who provided resources to Vanderbilt to allow me to go here. I don't know, I'll, I'll end with an image. Uh, if any of you have watched a Harry Potter movie, uh, you there are times when you Harry is standing in front of the mirror and he sees his parents or he sees his godfather or he sees people that he wants to see who've been part of him that mean so much to him. If I were able to stand in a mirror in front of a mirror and look at it, and see those people to whom I'm grateful for to be able to help me, enable me to be here today. It would be all those donors and all of those people who built the financial aid uh, and endowments here that enabled me to walk through a door that I never thought would be open uh, and now have been able to uh, hopefully transform myself, but also help begin to transform other younger learners uh, in a new way. So Kim, I'll stop there. Happy to go to Q&A or questions or chats, whatever you wanted to head to next. Thank you so much, Dean Brady. Um, that was wonderful. And, and I, I echo those sentiments that you just left us with. I am also very grateful um, to those donors and the people who have made um, my education um, possible. And, and that's one of the big reasons I'm here is because it's something I'm passionate about too and want to work hard for our future students who will change healthcare. Um, and so yes, now we will open it up for Q&A. Um, so again, I will invite anyone to submit um, a question through the Q&A feature on the Zoom. Um, and Dean Brady, if you would be willing to um, help me fill some questions and, and also Dominique, potentially if there are um, questions that you could answer from a student perspective, um, we would love to have you pipe in as well. Um, and so um, we, will, we will start with a question. Um, and I'll let you start with this one, Dr. Brady, and, and I might jump in as well. Um, but what role can faculty play in enhancing diversity and inclusion um, at the undergraduate medical education level and then potentially also the graduate medical education level? Yeah, there, there, are, there are innumerable ways that faculty can contribute. One is just being open and being willing to look at and see new and different perspectives. Uh, to have a passion for addressing the issue, to be willing to learn, because I think what we're all seeing is that there are aspects of equity and aspects of um, inequity that many of us didn't see or know or understand before. So being open to learn, uh, helping us diversify our faculty uh, also will help uh, uh, learning together and then being open to listening to our students. Uh, our students have wonderful ideas, as you heard about the EGFR, the changing of the name of a road, um, changing the curriculum, making adjustments. Listen to our learners. They have life experience. They may not have been through medical school yet, but they're, they've been through life and they have a lot of things that they've uh, encountered, endured, experienced, uh, learned that can be invaluable to us. So I think us listening to them 
is just as important at times as us teaching them. What do you think? What do you think, Kim? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and I think you spoke, and I think maybe we all know Vanderbilt is a special place. And I think that's one of the things that makes it so special is our students want to be agents of change. Um, and they come here um, with that passion and that fire. Um, and I think that this is a special place because they can, uh, they can approach their faculty and administration and say things need to be changed. Um, and when we are open and we listen, um, then we can work with them to really change. Um, and so I think that that's something that is um, hugely important um, for our students and ways that we can, we can work with them um, to do that. Um, I will mention um, one of the answers to that question is, is being available and being willing to mentor um, students or being willing to mentor um, younger residents um, or fellows. Um, and I think so often we think that to have a good mentor, that mentor has to be similar to us. And, and yes, sometimes that can be the case. Um, but to be a good mentor, you don't necessarily have to look like your mentee um, to be able to share um, good life experience. And so being open and willing um, to be that person that a student or a resident can come to um, and look, look for help and advice um, as they navigate medical school um, or their training um, is another really great way that faculty um, can help out. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree. And just to add to that, I think the, simil the sim similarities come in many different ways and similarities just become a point of contact and in that initial bridge. So it, it could be an interest in sports. It could be being from the same small town in rural Arkansas. It could be a love of classical music. It could be a major that you had in college. Uh, it could be race or ethnicity. It could be religion. There so many ways to have a point of contact and a commonality that begins the relationship. It's not the end of relationship, it's really the beginning. Okay, how about another question? Um, what are ways that alumni can further support diversity efforts at VUSM? And, and, and I will start with this one. Um, I, I think there are lots of ways that alumni um, can help with this effort. Um, from, from being available to those in your communities where you are. Um, so if you know a high school student, um, a promising high school student or college student who might be interested in medicine, um, really working again to mentor those students to um, to point them in the direction um, of medical schools, especially Vanderbilt. Um, but I, I think as we, as we look, especially for underrepresented um, students, um, it really needs to start before college. Um, and we really need to reach those students in middle school and high school to let them know that a career in medicine is something um, that they can do just like anyone else. Um, we are really working hard to try to find and some innovative ways to get um, our alums um, really plugged in with our current medical students. Um, and so that's something that I uh, will be working on in the future is trying to find ways that we can kind of increase the interaction between our alums um, and students to, to kind of grow that network um, and pipeline. Um, if you have students, we, we currently have formal programs with the four schools that I mentioned, but um, if you know students who are interested in attending those schools, sharing information about those pipeline programs so that once they get the campus, they know to, um, to seek those programs out, um, or just a couple of thoughts that come to mind. Um, Dean Brady, anything that you can think of? Yeah, I, I think you've made really good, good points, Kim. I mean, and, and the mentoring can be as early as elementary school and, and getting people interested in science and math uh, and medicine, um, but just getting people to envision things that they might not normally or traditionally have been able to envision for themselves. Uh, great opportunities for uh, alumni. Alumni also, if you're in another city being host for, for medical students as they uh, look around for places to do residency, 
that's very helpful or just being available to chat as Kim said, uh, creating new networks and new linkages. And then of course, I couldn't say, couldn't go this session without mentioning uh, donating uh, and, and helping create those scholarship of opportunities for other students uh, in the future. And uh, any, any amount, it, is okay. It is all it accumulate the cumulative effect is what's important. Uh, and so uh, those are just a few ways. Uh, Good deal. Thank you. Um, you guys feel free if you have burning questions, please put them in the Q and a um, the other thing alumni could do Kim is follow VU medicine on Instagram if you if you happen to have an Instagram account. Uh, we have, it's called VU Medicine, all one word, uh, a lot of great stories about what students are doing and faculty in there. So reading those, keeping up to date with what's going on here and retweeting them out to your networks, out to your friends and family uh, who may not be in medicine, but might want to know uh, what's going on, what's happening in healthcare these days. And a lot of that can come out uh, through those uh, ways as well. Instagram's a really good uh, portal for that. Twitter as well, but Instagram particular, it's longer stories. Thank you, Dean Brady. Um, so here's a question. What advice would you give current applicants um, who have passion and love for helping communities, um, but academically don't feel like enough? Um, as alumni, uh, as an, an alumni has really helped me this year, but I'm worried about past academics um, and how that might hinder me. Are you starting this this one or am I starting with this one? Um, it doesn't matter. Um, what I would start with is, um, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier when I kind of shared my story. Um, I, I didn't think I was going to get into medical school, even though I'd worked my entire life up, that, up until that point to achieve that goal. Um, I, I didn't think that I was enough. Um, and, um, and so I think you have to reach um, because what, just because you maybe don't see it as being possible doesn't mean it isn't possible. Um, and so that would be the first thing that I would start out um, with. Um, Dean Brady, what would you add to that? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I agree with you about reaching. Uh, everything that we reach for, we don't achieve, but if we don't reach, we can't. Uh, and so I wouldn't let the fear of what your past, uh, how your past might hinder you, but rather move forward with what you're learning and, and try and, and uh, use, use your past, use what you've learned from your past experiences to help enable you to see a different future and keep knocking on doors. Uh, apply multiple places, apply um, in, a, in a variety of settings. I, I know that all the schools that I applied to and all the residencies I applied to, I very quickly learned from some of them that I didn't want to be there. A few of them may have learned that I wasn't the right fit for them, but if, if the reach, if I had not reached out, I would never know. Yeah. So I would encourage you not to give up uh, on your dream uh, but uh, continue to pursue it and continue to reach out uh, to alumni and others to help you uh, and to keep, keep working toward it. Yeah, I would add that, that one thing that I have learned to, and realized more and more is that um, I think all of us who pursue medicine have this plan in our head about what that path should look like. Um, and there's not one path. There are many paths to medicine. And so just because your path isn't going the way that you envisioned it would go or should go doesn't mean that you don't ultimately arrive in the same spot. Um, and so um, I, I think taking a step back and understanding that your path might be a little different than what you thought it might be, um, but being able to look at those things um, and find ways to overcome those challenges that you've had might mean a little detour in your path, but the destination will ultimately be the same. 
Um, so it's okay to have a winding path. Okay, so we will probably um, maybe just finish with one more question. Um, can you discuss any collaborative initiatives um, with Meharry Medical College or other HBC schools um, if applicable. Um, and I will start by um, just um, reminding everyone of the pipeline programs um, that I mentioned earlier. So having formal partnerships with Fisk, um, Morehouse and Spelman colleges um, with our pipeline program. Um, and then to let everyone know about our Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance. Um, and Dean Brady, you might wanna speak to this as well. Um, but I think the Alliance has now um, been in place for 15, 20 years at this point, um, but really is a collaborative effort between Vanderbilt um, and Meharry um, to really drive um, community-based resource and really to impact the, um, the health of the community here in Middle Tennessee. Um, we have a relatively new leader of the Alliance um, Dr. Sinkfield, who um, is an amazing person. I've not yet gotten the opportunity to meet with her and chat with her. Um, and maybe Dean Brady can tell us a little bit more, but um, has a really impressive track record for, um, for working um, to reduce health disparities um, in certain populations. Yeah, I, um, you've talked about the pipeline programs, I think specifically to Meharry, the Alliance is a great evidence of the two institutions working together, uh, particularly around community-based re re research, but also case conferences that we sponsor with our students, where students from the two schools and other schools in the area get together to uh, work as teams to solve cases and to present solutions uh, to complexing problems. It's a really great partnership. Um, the Alliance started with Keith Matter as executive director, and then Consuelo Wilkins, who's now our vice president of health equity, and now Karen Wingfield, who's from Wake Forest, uh, very heavily involved in uh, radi radiation oncology and cancer-based, community-based research. Uh, extremely, extremely warm uh, person, uh, very accomplished in her own right, but very um, good at building partnerships and building linkages. So I think, Kim, when you meet her, you will enjoy meeting her. And uh, she's a great person to work with. Okay, thank you, Dean Brady. Um, if there are no more questions, I'm gonna check the Q&A section one more time. Um, but we will be very respectful of time and potentially give everyone just a few more minutes in this hour back. Um, we are so grateful to you for joining us um, this evening. Um, I, I hope you can tell that this is um, something that we are, we're very proud of our medical school and we're also very passionate um, uh, about being able to continue the legacy of our medical school. Um, so please feel free um, to reach out to me. If you have additional questions after this session, I would be happy to um, communicate via email or phone or potentially set up a Zoom if anyone would like to, to chat more um, about this. Um, and I will turn it back, I think, to Nikki um uh to close us out this evening yeah thank you all for joining us and thank you um dr vincent and dr brady for all of your contributions and for answering all those questions um i hope that everyone really enjoyed this like dr vincent said i know i did and um i'm also happy to be a part of this as well so Thank you all, and we will give you a few extra minutes in this hour back and um, let everyone go early, but thank you again for joining.